Right, uh, let's get started. Welcome everybody. So we're going to talk about uh, policy-driven platform Avar Nova Scheduler. I'm Ramke Krishnan from Dell. I head the NFE technology strategy. Adrian. Adrian Holman from Intel. Uh, Tim Henrich from Stira. Thank you. So I'd also like to thank, I mean, we are the team presenting, but there's a core team behind us who made this all happen. And also there have been a whole set of contributors, again, uh, contributing towards this uh, big effort here. And again, in interest of time, I'm not going to spell out all the names, but you have all the details here. So first, let's look at uh, what are the challenges with the current OpenStack Nova scheduler, right? Uh, both from an admin perspective and also user perspective. By admin, we mean really the uh, OpenStack uh, Nova admin, and user is essentially it could be any orchestrator or just any other user. So where are we with, uh, say, platform features beyond compute, right? I mean, so far the talk is always around compute. Uh, say, taken as software-defined storage use case, such as you want to add high-performance storage and also you desire compute isolation because storage and compute are running on the same node. Um, I mean, right now, in the current paradigm as we see, we have to wait for the next OpenStack release to make it happen. Basically, you're waiting out six months. And the next point we see is around ease of use, where you know, if you're looking at a generic use case to determine highly uh, loaded or unusable host, hey, I need to build custom tools for all this, right? Um, you know, can the admin write its own tools or the user write its own tools? No. Uh, you know, it's all basically you need to write code to, uh, you know, to develop these tools. And the last interesting part is what we're seeing is, you know, all the work has been focused on initial placement, um, but what about the other functions, say, you know, what we're really seeing is from NFV use cases, uh, there is a very strong need for dynamic mod monitoring and violation detection. And uh, monitoring, I mean, basically, uh, one of the strong uses there is essentially uh, dynamic monitoring around workload, workload consolidation. And the way things are right now, you have to design a one-off monitoring framework, and which is not, you know, closely tied to placement. Basically, you define your own framework and what type of, uh, you know, attributes are useful placement, and you go about doing, recreating the entire effort you put towards placement. Um, so now we talked about the challenges. So let's talk about certain use cases which uh, deliver value to the community. And really, the first one, you know, I pride myself for saying, hey, this is really the road to 5G, you know, what all we need to do. Uh, but that said, essentially, uh, the key idea here is around, um, you know, application performance awareness. By that, you know, how you deliver certain challenging workloads, such as, you know, needing, those needing low latency or re and reliable delivery, the most challenging ones. A great example of those are broadcast video, uh, distance learning, and, you know, augmented reality in the telco cloud. And here again, the scope of this examination is around how you deliver these applications. We're not talking about the cloud infrastructure for actually posting these applications here. And again, to slice and dice the problem, um, essentially when you're trying to deliver these applications, there is an NFE orchestrator involved, which is taking care of the end-to-end -end aspects, which means what needs to happen across data centers in the van, right? Or even within the data center, when you're creating a service chain to deliver functions, you know, uh, and which involves even selecting the right network functions for delivering the, you know, uh, the solution you want, that is in the scope of the NFE orchestrator. Our scope is really what does it mean from just from the infrastructure perspective, from OpenStack Nova perspective to deliver these, right? Which is basically, uh, you know, what is needed in the hardware and tying it to, uh, you know, what we need to do with respect to placement and other functions. And in the specific example, uh, you know, good set of VNFs. Uh, which we see are very useful as stateful firewall and, uh, you know, crypto for encryption, decryption of videos or any, any other function. And also when it comes to uh, something like wireless networks, a wireless video proxy is a critical function because essentially, you know, you're sending video at one rate, but then you're actually transcoding video to the desired rate for the mobile user. And depending on where the mobile user is, how mobile it is, you know, the quality of video he can receive is limited. And we need to do the transcoding, you know, as an application. Those are uh, 
good VNF uh, network function examples, which, you know, we're talking about when you virtualize them, what happens. And uh, for delivering these challenging uh, use cases, you know, around these uh, virtual network functions, essentially what we see is, you know, from the compute side, uh, we need fine-grained resource partitioning for the VMs, you know, belonging to the uh, network functions. And what is interesting is so far, uh, you know, there is always a talk about prescriptive methods of delivering these applications, say, this is the one and only way to do it. But what we are seeing is not necessary. It's all about meeting the application needs. In this case, uh, you know, low latency reliable delivery. That means if you are able to build the right amount of isolation security infrastructure, then you can indeed deliver the application. From By that, what we're really saying is one method is you can use dedicated cores and NUMA awareness and uh, L3 cache partitioning enabled by Intel RDT uh, or resource director technology and SRAOV. But what is also interesting is, hey, if you don't have SRAOV, it's fine. You could even use the DPDKV switch as an alternative. But as long as you're able to dedicate separate cores for the DPDKV switch and also be able to partition L3 cache for it, in the sense you build isolated pools of res pool of resources for it, and you know you can still deliver this application that efficiently. Except for perhaps what happens in the case of SRAOV, you'll be consuming lesser CPU cores, and you could get the hardware acceleration benefit. That's kind of the key point we want to hone in on. And if none of these are options are available, you could use dedicated physical servers, which could mean even microservers. So basically, these are these choices which will deliver the right amount of isolation infrastructure. And when it comes to the network, uh, you know, uh, essentially the real focus we need is overlay, not just overlay QoS, but also the underlay becomes critical. You know, just the data center fabric, the end to end. And what we see as a need, real need is high QoS, and minimum buffer depth in all the switches, you know, the underlay. And when it comes to storage, high performance logging is a critical need, um, you know, and again, uh, NVMe-based SSD storage would be desirable as respect to pure SSD storage. And there's kind of a great relation to this, you know, essentially tying it to, you know, end-to-end -end service assurance for these. Um, logging and log analysis is a critical piece to make sure that, hey, I have these flows, they're indeed following the same path as they should, right? And, and if you're doing real-time log analysis, then storage becomes a critical piece. And, you know, as you can see from this picture on the right side, you know, hey, if I messed up and I started dropping packets, and, you know, you, trans you have an, one opportunity to just transmit these packets, you know, there is no retransmission opportunity because of the low latency requirements. You can see that, hey, if you started, even a single packet drop could potentially result in a poor quality video, as you can see below. Right, you know, uh, unhappy customer versus a happy customer where you delivered the right amount of security and isolation. And now moving on to some other use cases, essentially, um, so what does it take to deliver a classic enterprise type of a cloud? I mean, not so challenging as what we talked about so far, like say email, uh, CRM in the telco cloud. Uh, again, here, exemplary data plane BNFs or stateful firewall, IDS, IPS, uh, van optimization or you know IPsec based crypto. Um, from uh, again, uh, from a compute's perspective, what we really see is you know deterministic performance is the key need. Uh, there you could use NUMA uh, awareness and SROV or just NUMA awareness and more cores. Kind of the same concept we talked about. Uh, from a network, there are no specific HA requirements, and you know from a storage again high performance logging. And the last, least challenging of the use cases is, hey, if I want to deliver cost-effective residential broadband, uh, you know, cost is key through the telco cloud. Uh, what we see is NAT is one of the popular network functions. Uh, here, what we are really seeing is from a compute network, we will institute some max capacity limits, but not really min guarantees, because for min guarantees, you need to pay more money. Basically, it's a tiered service model. And, you know, SSD, uh, basically, not even SSD, uh, uh, hard HDD for low cost storage. Again, just want to clarify that these are all exemplary. There are different ways of slicing and dicing these based on you know what the operator wants to do. Now, mapping these two, you know, essentially what you would like to accomplish through the policy driven approach. Um, essentially, our goal is to uh, minimize any vendor lock-in and dependency 
while we uh, you know maximize the feature velocity in kind of beating all these release cycles you know it's not going to be six months agile delivery model how do we get there right from that the number one point is you know extensibility right uh, so uh, how can the admin or the user right add new capabilities you know not just you know compute but storage it could be cinder or it could be neutron constraints on the fly and get them to deployment you know quickly um, and while in the whole process, our goal is to minimize additional code we write, right? And the next point is around understandability. Uh, for example, it should be all human readable scheduling policies, right? Um, and so that uh, you know, analysis tools can be built on a need basis without any uh, issues. And essentially, that means there are no need for any custom analysis tools. And the last point is around monitoring. We talked about, hey, uh, you know, NFE example around the need for workload consolidation or other use cases. Our goal is to make sure, you know, while we deliver the rich policy, the admin of the user has a single representation for, you know, monitoring a type of framework, right? And that means, hey, uh, just like placement, I'm not waiting to, uh, you know, deliver my monitoring feature, you know, it can be made available, um, you know, pretty smoothly, right, in an agile fashion. And with that, to sum up, you know, with all this, uh, how do you go about it? Essentially, our approach is really a best of breed, a combination of imperative and declarative choices. Uh, when it comes to imperative interface choices, uh, we'll be extending the current JSON filter, which is there in OpenStack Nova. Um, and what this enables is, the, you, I mean, basically, it empowers the user to uh, customize specific applications. We see, essentially, you know, some of the challenging ones where uh, the NFE orchestrator or the operator wants complete control, then, uh, you know, opening up all the knobs are useful. And people are familiar with networking, you know, they know about open flow. This is kind of uh, very similar to that approach. But we also realize that it's equally important, in fact, um, even more powerful to, you know, introduce the uh, declarative interface choices, uh, where essentially, uh, you know, it could be around JSON filter extensions to the current NOVA flavors, which is, you know, quite a popular deployment model today. And uh, the other option could be uh, around data log embedded in AML. Again, data log is a powerful uh, variation of, uh, you know, simplified version of Prolog, but yet very powerful, uh, which can directly access uh, uh, SQL database tables. For flexible, it can be used for flexible, uh, you know, constraint specification, you know, whatever you want, any type of new constraints and also direct database manipulation. Again, here the goal is, uh, while addressing uh, understandability, make it really simple for the user to use, but it's also extensible framework for the admins. That said, I would like to hand it off to Adrian, who will give us, okay. you know, some more, go through some more examples, give a very quick overview of where uh, OpenStack Nova is, and, you know, some of the specific challenges around placement. Okay. Thanks, Ramki, for teeing up that vision and some of the benefits that we see can come from investing in policy-based scheduling. So I wanted to talk first about the, the imperative-related benefits. So we already have an imperative-related scheduler in OpenStack today, and I'll talk about more of that in a moment. But in this example, looking at what imperative request means when you start to roll in policy, the idea that we're putting forward here is that you can combine multiple sets of requests into that imperative set. So in, in the example showing here, let's say you've got a particular service level you're trying to achieve, and, and based on that, you know that if you allocate a NUMA-related platform, you allocate some SROV device, possibly for networking, possibly for acceleration. Or if you don't get that, adding NUMA and the possibility of adding extra cores, maybe in the first case you just needed one or two cores, the second case 10 would deliver the same service level, but obviously with different uh, constraints and uh, consumption of your resources. So what policy-driven scheduling allows you to do is make that request going, I need to fulfill a service and I need to do it in any of these particular ways. And what we can do with the policy then is to take both of those or how many ever requests you want to roll into it, look at the entire set of hosts you've got in your environment and figure out which of those can fulfill the imperative asks. Based on that, you, you can determine a list uh, typically, we look at waiting then to kick in, but with policy-driven scheduling, what we can do is we can uh, prioritize parts of the ask that will work out better for some type of parameter. 
We're not saying what that is right now. It could be you want to prioritize based on power consumption or resource utilization. So in this case, you may say host two because that has Newman SROV and I only need two cores. I can consume less power potentially to fulfill this uh, service requirement. So that gets weighted out on top. When you look at a, a declarative example, uh, and this is more uh, forward thinking, I think, but if you were to describe more in, uh, in terms of what the workload really needs from the infrastructure, and in this example we're saying, uh, imagine you need a workload that's looking for a low latency, reliable delivery mechanism. In that context, the admin, through this declarative method, can have already specified in the policy spec, in the policy store, what that type of a categorization means. So one example, it could be ephemeral local storage backed by SSDs, that's the non-persistent store. Just because you know you've got a workload that needs to access the SSDs really quickly, it's dealing with a large data set. You could, to, to cater for the reliable delivery piece, look at how you might want to allocate uh, caches on the platform or CPU pinning or lots of different uh, properties. The, the point of the declarative path here is that you're making it an admin and potentially in time a user driven thing to declare what that type of categorization represents. And with the policy driven scheduler, we can take that as an input, which is now no longer imperative, figure out what the imperative related asks uh, for that really represent, and use that to both filter and if you have a selection, weight host. So that's where we want to get to. I guess it's important to say where we're at right now. And if you look at the way the Nova scheduler is constructed, it's got this mix of uh, filtering capability. A really expansive list has been developed there. We're at 30 plus, I think even 32 right now. And you can combine through the, the, the config spec, you create the admin defines in Nova, the order in which you want to run these different filters. Ultimately, that will get you, uh, excuse me, that will get you the subset of hosts in your environment that meet that imperative request. So whichever one of these hosts that you decide to land the workload on is going to meet the needs of that particular uh, specification. What kicks in next is the waiting functionality, and waiting figures out what order you should look to try and deploy a virtual machine on those hosts. So to look a little bit more than at that filter, uh, and I'm just showing some examples of filtering here. You've got um, uh, the default list, you know, compute uh, capabilities, availability zones. Um, not shown on the list, you've got like NUMA filters, there's um, aggregate instant extra specs filters, PCI filters. Uh, like I said, a really comprehensive list. The key point here is always that it's generally admin driven for, uh, well certainly admin driven for configuring which filters you're going to run and uh, for many of them the admin defines what uh, metadata or what attributes that filter is going to process. So for instance, if you're looking at flavors, the admin creates the flavor, the admin tags that flavor with extra specs saying wh what that flavor really represents. And I'm just giving some examples here that we know are applicable in an NFE context. You may say you need a certain amount of memory, of course. You may look at huge pages and the amount you want. You look at the uh, new topology you're looking for, CPU pinning. Um, there's a whole set of things related to the network you might want to go configure in there. Uh, there's a set of properties that you may want to be able to parse that come in through the image metadata service. Um, and based on all of that, we'll figure out what the right set of hosts that can comply with that imperative ask are. Moving on then, the, the waiting. So uh, there's a four, possibly five, I think, actually waiting uh, methods exist. Uh, the RAM-based, which by default will try to uh, sp spread the VM allocation across the entire set of hosts that you identified, have or meet the imperative ask that the filter schedulers uh, uh, determined for you. Um, there's a, a metrics method which you can look at various host state metrics and combine those and put different weights around it. Uh, IO ops per second. Um, and then affinity, soft and uh, affinity and soft anti affinity. And I think there's also one related to the disk. And you can define the sort of normalization properties for each of these weights and then do an AND statement that you end up with this uh, kind of one to N order for what the, the applicable hosts are. And the example I'm showing here is when you've just got, let's say, the RAM waiting schedule uh, or la the RAM waiter involved. So given that's how it works today, and we know it doesn't meet to the kind of vision that uh, Rampke teed up for us, the kind of problem statements that we're looking at in the shorter term, 
to start with are looking at the fact that it's the administrator that's required to specify uh, all of these imperative asks, um, and they must do it in a Nova-centric way. So we don't have a method of reaching out to the other systems in the cloud to say, hey, I also need to consider the network or the storage-related properties. Uh, it's not possible today to make, in, in a single request, a different resource uh, specification asks. So um, you, you can't, like I mentioned, go from, uh, I need to deliver on a, a service X, and that can be uh, you know, multiple sets of ways of how to go and deliver that. And we can't do that under policy governance. And then the third piece we want to look at is that we can't uh, define different weighting methods for different parts of the cloud. So as you define different regions within your cloud, possibly through host aggregates, you can't say in those regions I'm going to RAM stack, or in another region I'm going to go a really dispersed <coughs> type of model. So with that, I'm going to introduce Tim, who's going to talk uh, in more detail about the, the steps that we'd like to take to try and close some of these gaps. All right, thank you, Adrian. All right, that was great. Um, and so I think at this point, the thing to keep in mind is that we're actually targeting two kinds of folks using Nova, right? We're targeting the end users, and what we want to be able to do is enable them to write policy statements that actually control what kind of scheduling decision gets made. But we're also targeting administrators, and we want to give them policy control over what scheduling decisions get made. And so what I'm going to start with is an approach to giving end users the ability to write policy statements to make scheduling decisions. And um, on this slide, what you'll see is the, the blue stuff is stuff that already exists in Nova. And the green stuff is the stuff that's new and that we're introducing. And so if you're a user today using Nova and you want some sort of rich control over which hosts your VM gets assigned to, what you can do today is use JSON filter. All right, and JSON filter, think of this as like an and or not expression where the tests that you're running are things like how much RAM does it have, is the disk larger than this, and so on, right? So you've got ands and ors and nots over this, over the properties of any host. And so using JSON filter, the, the end user has a great deal of control over which host they eventually select for scheduling. What you don't have today, though, is the ability for the end user to provide weights and provide preferences about which hosts they would prefer to have. So in the example that Adrian talked through earlier, we've got uh, let's say the end user wants to, to say that I prefer NUMA and SROV, but I'll also take NUMA and 10 extra cores. And so there's no way today within Nova to actually for the end user to say, those are my preferences, go off and give me a machine that satisfies those preferences. So JSON weight is a new weight that we're, that we're proposing, and the idea there is that the user can use a language very similar to JSON filter, but describe the weights that they, that they want to assign to each of the hosts, all right? And so from the end user's point of view, I've got the hard constraints, I can express those with JSON filter, I've got soft constraints, I can express those with JSON weight, and now I, as a user, have a great deal of control over the actual host that ends up, that my VM ends up being scheduled on. Yeah? Okay, so that's the end user. Uh, and now what we have is a number of options for the administrator to take control and provide policy statements dictating how hosts should actually be scheduled. And the thing to keep in mind about the administrator is that it's quite different than the end user, right? The end user has total knowledge, total control over exactly what hosts they want. The administrator, on the other hand, really, when they're trying to write policy, what they care about is governing how each user request gets mapped down into the hardware, right? And so, fundamentally, what, it, what an admin wants to do is write this, this policy expression that represents a map from a user request and uh, to the collection of hosts that, that satisfy that request. Okay? And so, one way of doing this is to introduce two new filters. Uh, one of the f and, and these filters are very much analogous to the JSON filter and JSON weight I spoke about a moment ago for the end user. The difference here for admin JSON white and admin JSON filter is that it's the administrator writing the policy, not the end user. And so if the administrator's writing this policy, and remember this policy is something that maps user requests down to the host that satisfy them, there has to be some policy store for that administrator to put that policy into, all right? But just like the JSON filter and JSON white, the admin versions of those filters give the administrator the ability to write both hard constraints and soft constraints that describe how to map any particular user request into a host. 
And so in this example, the, what, the way we see this being different is that the user request is a, is a description. It says, I need low latency and reliable delivery. And the administrative policy actually dictates exactly how that kind of request gets mapped down into hosts. In particular, uh, the administrator might decide that what, what this request actually needs is NUMA and SRIOV, preferentially, or NUMA and 10 extra hosts. So there's this level of indirection that the administrative uh, weights provides. The pros here are that this is, um, uh, the, 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 the main motivation here is that this kind of, of, of administrative interface allows the administrator to adapt scheduling decisions as external data such as from Nova and such as from ne Neutron and Cinder become available, which is something the Nova team's working hard on this cycle. Um, the con, of course, to this kind of approach is it's yet another filter on the long list of filters that we already have. The alternative, uh, another uh, approach to empowering an administrator to write policy to control scheduling decisions is to modify an existing filter. In particular, what I've shown here on the slide is, well, we could actually add a policy field to either the, the current Nova flavors or the current host aggregates. And in the, in the flavors case, that policy is really sort of a souped up version of the extra specs for those of you who are familiar with it. Remember that a, po remember that a flavor is something that basically implicitly describes a whole collection of hosts. And so what this policy uh, field would allow you to do is get, get even finer grain control over exactly what hosts belong to this particular flavor. All right. In the host aggregate example, if we extend that to include policy, really the power that you end up with is that if you've got one host aggregate, you can, the administrator can define weights over how the hosts within that host aggregate actually get scheduled. So if in one case, the, the uh, administrator decides that he wants to actually distribute workloads as evenly as possible across all those hosts, then he could define weights to do so. And if in another case of the host aggregate, the administrator decides that I want to bin pack as many of those VMs on a single host as I can, then the administrator can likewise define hosts for that particular host aggregate. All right, and so in both these cases, what we're seeing is that the administrator has the ability to control scheduling and take into account the user request. And in so doing, we're moving towards these visions that Ramke and Adrian discussed. Pros. This is extensible, again, by the admin. The nice thing about existing filters is that everybody already knows what a flavor and host aggregate is. And of course, um, now it's easier for people to understand. Of course, the downside is that it adds complexity to the existing constructs. OK, and with that, I'll give it back to Ramke to wrap up. Um, thank you, Tim. So just to give a status of where we are, uh, we are in a concept stage with several draft specs. And you know the imperative part is around JSON weight, um, and the declarative part we have a, you know several options: new scheduler, uh, which is the policy-based scheduler, then new filter plus weight, which is the admin JSON filter option, then again uh, modifying existing flavor or specific host aggregate-based policies, right? And in fact, it's not just this presentation. We are going to have three more sessions at the summit. One is the NOVA scheduler working session. Other is the Congress integration session. Other is the NFE orchestration buff. Please do join us there. And what are the key takeaways to summarize? We have contributors, 10 plus companies. And again, uh, you know, we have really an operator advisory board, like to call it. You know, thanks for all the input. And um, our goal is a policy driven scheduling and you know, towards delivering service assurance addressing complex scenarios you know, on the road to 5G, IoT. And our approach is indeed a combination of best of breed, you know, declarative plus imperative. The imperative case, uh, user uh, you know, describes desired hardware policy in the policy language or JSON weight, right? I mean, completely open interface. And declarative, user describes the application, what you know, he needs, and admin uh, maps the uh, you know, the application to the hardware capabilities, you know, host aggregates and all those, uh, which uh, sums up as admin JSON filter and weight, and also enhancements to uh, flavors and host aggregates. And, you know, with that said, we do have a weekly meeting, 8 a.m. Pacific, which is uh, 13 UTC. Uh, please do join us regularly. Thank you so much. And we're open to questions. to uh,
providing anti-affinity with the scheduler via a method like this? Um, I think so right now, definitely as we see, there are affinity and anti-affinity rules, but the way we see it is they're very simplistic, but with this paradigm, they can certainly be more enhanced. Right now, the rules are more, hey, uh, these are basically, it's just uh, whether I belong to a particular server or not, that's a level of comp uh, affinity and anti-affinity. With this framework, extensible framework, our goal is to make sure that you can have much more complex rules. Basically, you could craft a rule based on distance, network distance. Hi, are there going to be any standard terms like you mentioned, low latency or resiliency and things like that, that can be mapped by users? Um, so the also for cloud interoperability? Uh, um, good question. So uh, that's why it's a combination of both terms. I mean, uh, you know, if you even go back to the 5G white papers or all those, right? I mean, um, there is never, uh, you know, a particular value to a low latency, it's always a range, right, correct. That's, that's, how, that's how we are modeling it this way, correct. But it's also about a combination of separate different properties, low latency and reliable delivery, uh, you know, zero packet loss. That's the challenge you're trying to meet, right, so. And then I agree on the value of low latency, but the terms like low latency, reliability, are there going to be some fixed terms that people can use to describe these needs? So there is, uh, even there, I mean, just like the word real time, uh, there is going to be quite a bit of variability. It all comes to the specific applications you're talking about. I think that's the best way to look at it. So that's why it's low with a range, not saying it's the exact value, so. Oh, I, I, but no. Like, we're not going to codify low latency yeah. and build it into the code. Right. In fact, it's quite the opposite, which is that, let's say, the administrator in that case would actually define what low latency means. And that would be the point, that you can write an expression that says, here's what, for me, as the administrator, low latency in my data center means. And then you've got your user who just says, I need low latency. I don't really know or care necessarily what that means. Yeah? Can you introduce uh, a little about the integration of Congress? Because I, I know that Congress is also a policy-driven engine. So, yeah. Right, uh, that's a good question, yeah, right. So, so one of the things that we're exploring with now is, is how do you make policy support uh, possible within NOVA? Uh, one of the longer things that we've talked about in Congress for a while is it would be great if all of the other projects in OpenStack had policy capabilities. Because if they did, then you could take policies written in Congress, which span all the silos of compute, networking, storage, and so on, have Congress do some analysis over those policies and sort of pick out the compute-related portion and hand it off to NOVA, and pick out the, the networking-related portion and hand it to Neutron. And so you could see this kind of distributed policy-based enforcement. But of course, that assumes that all the, all the different projects within OpenStack have policy support. And so what we're focused on here is how do we provide policy support that's valuable in and of itself for NOVA's end users, but that could also perhaps eventually be used by Congress to do distributed enforcement. Thank you all so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.